been driving all along, feel like I'm dreaming. Uh, okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Street Apologist Live. This is the show where we serve the underserved and look into the overlooked. I'm your host, Vocab Malone. And tonight we're going to be talking about the founder of One West Israelism, commonly called Abba Bivens, his family. Now, it may seem like a strange topic, but you'll understand here in a second because it deals with the history of this movement, specifically his great-grandson. And um, Abba Bivens' great-grandson is very, very... Jewish. And to help me talk about that today is my man and yours, Abu Kamar. How you doing today? Welcome to the program, my friend. Well, you muted yourself, so I can't do nothing about that, but you're welcome to join in and turn on your audio anytime you'd like. <laughs> Let me know if you have uh, any problems or something that I need to do. Okay, so I'm going to play this video, and uh, Boos, I still don't have your your audio, but I'm just going to play this first video. This video was sent to me by Nico Colazzo. Shout out to you, brother. Thank you very much for letting me know what's going on. You know, if you wonder if I have something, just send it, because you guys are what makes this happen. So shout out to Nico. I think he's my fellow Paisan. And uh, again, Abu, <clears throat> let's get you in here. Uh, it's, uh, you're in the green room. I don't know what's what's going on. Okay, yeah, there it is. I'm unmuted now. Can you okay. hear me now? Yeah, okay, okay. Good. Okay, excellent. I'm going to play this video, and um, let's talk about it. Here we go. Funny, so he used a YouTube clip. Of That's the guy a wrong thing. <laughs> and if y'all notice something, Everyone, did, did y'all notice the freak, name? Freak, freak. Forget that. Just party. Nah, my grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great grandfather started some sect of black Israelites. That's like pretty known today. We're here with. Uh That's what caught our attention. So Abu, a little bit was said already. I'm gonna play yeah, it I'm here. Yeah, you don't want to play the whole clip straight. You want us to try and introduce it. Uh, I want to comment a little, little bit on it. This is fair use, so we're gonna add our commentary. Shout out to T.Y. Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. And uh, that's where this clip comes from. And it's a clip of him interviewing a young student named Ozzy Bibbins. He is a hip-hop artist as well as a student at Yeshiva University. Yep. Up in and, uh, yep. Up in Washington Heights. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, Yeshiva has been in the news recently because they wanted to keep a biblical stance in regards to certain ethical questions, and it's been um, quite a furor in the news, and I believe deals with religious freedom, and it looks like as of now they've been able to uh, stand their ground for last I knew. That's all I'm going to say about mm -hmm. that story. But uh, T.Y. Hashem, thank you, Hashem, and Yid on the Street, that's where this comes to us from. This is from an Instagram clip. Thank you for capturing this content. Subscribe to him. Let's play this clip again. Listen carefully to what's being said, and we are going to analyze it. Just party? Nah. My grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great-grandfather started some sect of black Israelites. That's, like, pretty known today. We're here with... Ozzy Vivens. Ozzy, where are you from? Cleveland. CLE till I die. Are you in NYU? Yeah, I just got here, like, a week ago. So here's how it works. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions on Parsha's bow. Each question, you get $2. You get all of them right, you get 100 bucks. Ready? What was the... Okay, so he's going to quiz him, and then he gets some money for the questions. Uh, Abu, can you explain the nature of the questions? Because I sent you this earlier. You've seen this. Because some of the questions may not make sense to people. Can you explain what this quiz has to do with so people know the background? Well, I mean, it's it's basically just questions out of Exodus. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't think any rabbinic. Like, the questions are pretty much biblical. But notice, everyone, he said he just got there. So yep. he's... A lot of people, you know, the founder of One West is known as Abba... Bivens, popularly spelled B-I-V-E-N-S. That's how One Westers typically spell it. But the man who founded One West, his surname was actually spelled B-I-B-B-I-N-S, precisely how this young man's name is spelled. The correct This young way. man is a, descend a descendant of the man known as Abba Bibbins. That's who he's referring to. Yep, that's his great-grandfather. Here we go. Nah, my grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great grandfather started some sect. I was on Parsha's bow. Each question, you get two dollars. You get all of them right, you get a hundred bucks. Why? So God knew that they were Jews and He would pass over them. During which plague? Bakat That's correct. Are you Sephardic? Nah, my grandmother is. So the beginning of the 
the miniature interview was clipped together real quick, and then he does the quiz. But now in this section right here, they're going to kind of revisit the little biographical part, and he's going to go more in depth. It's a very brief video. It's less than a minute and a half, but you're going to get a little more detail here. So, Abu, tell everyone what they should be listening to. Just, uh, I mean, just him alluding. It's very short. It's just him alluding to his ancestry and alluding to who his his, uh, his uh, grandfather was, you know, a great-grandfather. Now, you know, th he got the name Abba Bivens. We don't like using that name um, mm. because of Abba, father. Uh, what mm -hmm. do you think we should be calling him? Just Bivens, Mr. Bivens, Eber? What should we call him here? Yeah, why not Edward B Bibbins? We just say Bibbins. Mr. Bibbins, you just say Bibbins. So do you think we should start transitioning to saying the name right, which is Bibbins, even oh, though the definitely. one Westers historically definitely. have said Bivens? Yeah, if you want. I'm, you're the one who says the one Westers, uh, what's it, the Jesus Christ, whom the one Westers ignorantly call Yahweh So uh -huh. you could say Edward Meredith Bibbins, whom many one Westers historically have ignorantly called Abba Bibbins. <laughs> Good one. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Listen, everyone listen carefully to this. Puerto Rican, my grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great grandfather started some sect of black Israelites that's like pretty known today. It's chilling. And then my grandfather decided he wanted to convert because like he wanted to be part of the Jewish community. He converted, married a Puerto Rican woman, and then my dad was born. And then they weren't sure if the conversion process for my grandmother was correct, so my dad had to get also converted when he was like a little bit older. That's a crazy story. The bottom line is juice come in different flavors. Okay, ready? How many? You so real quick. There's a, so much there, just in that little part. I don't know how much the young man knows about the sect. He seemed mm. to have just a passing knowledge, but seemed to have mild pride in the fact. So he may not know a lot because it, it, you almost wonder if he – it's it's like an ambiguous <clears throat> legacy perhaps uh, if you understand what One West has come to become today. But he says – started some sect of the black Israelites that's pretty well known today. It's chilling. The it's chilling <laughs> is kind of like, you know, it's a cool, th it's kind of a cool thing. That's what's up. You know, what, what are you laughing at, man? No, just that. I'm, I'm glad you're here to translate. It's chilling. Cause I wondered about that. I was like, that's, uh, it's curious. No, but I agree with your interpretation. Yeah. He seems to, to celebrate it on a certain level, you know? Yeah. You know, he probably doesn't know about, you know, Hakka running around saying he's a Talmudic scholar and GMS Rochester, you know, cursing people out and telling Ammonites and Edomites they're going to be concubines and slaves. You know, he probably doesn't know about all that, you know. But here we go. Listen to this. Let's see how he does on this quiz. Ailey, how many men left Egypt? 600,000. That's correct. The final one. What famous Jewish food was invented in this week's Parsha? Matzah. <laughs> yeah, that is correct. There you go. 100 bucks, baby. I was from 1 to 10. How good is matzah? Shmura matzah is a solid 11 out of 10. Yehuda matzah with some cream cheese or something else, it's a solid 8. What's your opinion on his food ratings there? Uh, see, I'm, keep in mind, I'm, I'm outside of, you know, the, the Holy Land, but my impression is that Shmura matzah is pretty horrible, but maybe I've just had a bad brand. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost inedible. He gave it 8 with cream cheese. No, no, that was the Yehuda matzah, but the, oh, the Shmura sorry, matzah, sorry. he gave it 11 out of 10. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I, I find it inedible, but I don't know. Okay. He may be, uh, you know, him having so many family in, in, in the Holy Land, he may have uh, access to a much better well, quality. So you're referring to the Bibbins family being in Israel. Yes. I'm going to switch back over. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Because a lot of people may not understand. So again, on this channel, a key thing we do is focus on Hebrew Islamism. That includes the history. And I'm just going to be honest here. This is not a bragging thing. And it's primarily because of Abu. So I'm giving him the credit and shout out. I'm just the, the loud mouth with a somewhat of a platform here, as long as the Lord allows. We have uncovered a lot of One West history on this channel. Hebrew is a light history in general, but especially One West history. Um, we'll never know as much as the people who were there, the honest ones at least, but for this generation, especially when the older folks are sometimes tight-lipped or, uh, what's the word, catatonic, where it's kind of scattered, helter-skelter with their oral histories, um, we've done some good stuff, but there's a lot more to be done. And the problem is some of the eyewitnesses are in the last years, perhaps, of their life. I mean, we're already talking great-grandson now here of Mr. Bibbins. But this was happenstance that he happened to be interviewed 
one of my supporters happened to see it. Shout out to Nico again. And now here we are talking about it. And it, mm. I think, should throw a lot of One Westers off. But explain this Israel connection to the Bibbins family, please, Abu. Wait, say that. Say the question again. The, 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 what connection, the connection to Israel, how we've got some folks who yes. moved there. Okay, so something that a lot of people don't know. So first off, let me back this up and say this. There is a phenomenon that there's not enough discussion on, which is the phenomenon of Hebrew Israelites converting to Judaism. Facts. And in my experience, when you bring this up and you bring up groups like Hatzad Harishon, which actually actively sought to bring Israelites more effect, uh, more fully into the Jewish fold, yes, stepping into Zion, which is about Hatzad Harishon, um, the, I've found that a lot of Hebrew Israelites treat the idea – of Hebrew Israelites converting to Judaism at, like a joke, that it's a joke to them. And I've heard people say multiple times things like, well, the only people who fall for that are like idiots, you know, mm-hmm. some, you know, nobodies. But the thing is, if you want to talk about like a, a, a bit of a coup that was scored by the, the rabbinic side, they converted at least one of Bibin's sons, possibly both of them. And some of the descendants of the founders of One West Several generations deep are in rabbinic Judaism. Uh, his uh, Bibbins' grandson Daniel, uh, who's a filmmaker, who's uh, was in uh, covered in um, in uh, Haaretz. There was a, a thing in Haaretz about him. He moved to a uh, a kibbutz in like near the, the border with Jordan, Israel's border with Jordan. So, so uh, you know, kibbutz is like a communal type. Village situation. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say kibbutz. Maybe I should say a, a settlement or something like that. But yeah, basically, yeah, they're right on the Jordanian border. And so and a then, number, there's a bunch of Bibbins, um descendants, like three generations deep, living in the state of Israel. Now, and real quick, you said Her- uh, Haaretz. Could you explain Haaretz to those who don't know? Oh, I'm sorry. Haaretz is a, is a Jewish publication. It's a, an Israeli publication. They did an article on him a while back uh, on Daniel Bibbins, who's the grandson, and his uh, Daniel's father, Chaim Bibbins. Uh, right. There was this interesting article about them. You know, I'll see if I can pull it up. But. So um, when we come to Ozzy, um, Ozzy, he um, he uh, is an artist. He does music. It seems like mainly mainly like a, a type of hip hop, from what I can gather. And um, you know, he's a, a fresh student there. And um, you know, we got some listeners who who roll around Manhattan roll around some of the boroughs, they could run into them, you know, Abu? What do you think? Is it possible? Wait, say that last part again? Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, now, yeah, definitely. He might pass a One West group on the street. I wonder what he'll think if if he even realizes, you know, that that's the group that his, that they're the descendants of a group started by his great-grandfather, you know? Well, as far as the lineage, I guess as far as lineage, he'd be covered on their 12 tribes chart. Yes, yes. That are and, uh, uh, like, a Bivens student, Bivens student constructed. But go ahead. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they would necessarily have a a problem with him. Interestingly enough, some of Bivens' other descendants are, in terms of outward appearance, or you know, like some of his great great grandchildren. You know, the grandchildren of his grandson are very European, stereotypically European in their outward appearance. You know, and so it's interesting. It's reaching the point where some of Bivens' descendants. You know, even though they're in the state of Israel, if they passed, uh, you know, a one Western on the street, the one Western might, uh, <laughs> you know, might condemn them. Almost certainly them. not guess that these are the descendants of their founder. Yeah. And we have proof of that. Um, we're not going to show any clear footage of the then children. They'd now be adults. But we do have something we can show. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, just, yeah, uh, the members of his descendants, you know, members of his family in Israel, they've posted a lot of stuff on social media. I would say it's fairly private, but like you said, there's stuff that's 10 and 12 and 13 years old that maybe in a flash, at least to capture the the morphologies you could show just to show how stereotypically European some of the, the features are, you know, how, and it's a, it's a lesson in, in how you cannot determine a person's lineage from their outward appearance. You know, it's, a, it's certainly a lesson in that regard. Yeah, imagine being a one wester and Bibbins' grandchildren pass you on the street and you condemn them based upon their morphology. Great great grandchildren. Yeah, the oh, grandchildren sorry, of his grandchildren. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh but can you explain the one I'm gonna show, could you explain um 
Anything else about that? Well, all I'm going to say is that it's a great granddaughter of Bibbins' great uh, of it's excuse me, it's a granddaughter of Bibbins, the granddaughters of Bibbins' uh, own grandson. That's the best way to say it. Yeah, that's the best way to put Cause, it. Because because he had more than one son. Uh, yeah, Bibbins he had two did. sons, if I'm not mistaken, and they had kids, and their kids had kids, and now you have young people in their late teens now walking around who are four generations removed from mm-hmm. uh, Abba Bibbins. It's been that long, you know. And, and and they run across the spectrum. And I'm going to show this in a second. Uh, the sons are briefly mentioned in the infamous, famous video with Naftali bin Naftali when he mentions how Bibbins knew that the 12 tribes chart was false, but that it was a good hook to use because Naftali says, and then him, his sons and then they moved away. And those yeah. other guys started teaching it as truth. So he's referring he to the way doctrinally and physically, I guess, but certainly doctrinally, at least one of his sons, his, his daughter-in-law, who's, who's buried like uh, in the same cemetery right next to Bibbins. I've been to Bibbins' grave. Uh, his daughter-in-law, Esther Bibbins, was a, a, a major player in Hatsad Harishon. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the son who was married to her uh, was likewise had some connection to Hatsad Harishon as well. So here but I'm yeah, going to show – I'm going to show uh, these briefly just so you can see. We know what we're talking about. Um, now, these people are no longer minors. They'd be adults. The images have been altered, though, so it's still obscured. But this will give you an idea here of what I'm saying. Um, so these yeah, are Bibbins' great, great grandchildren. Yeah, four generations removed. So some of his descendants. Yeah, it, it's like I said, it's a, it's a testament to how foolhardy it is to try to determine someone lineage, someone's lineage based on their outward appearance. You know, within just a few generations, you can look very different from one of your ancestors and be very different culturally, you know. And we have multiple means of confirmation for what we're talking about here. Uh, but some of it we don't. We're not going to show to keep uh, the family's privacy because really it's about Bibbins and then his um, ideological descendants, if you will, not necessarily blood relatives, although it relates to uh, One West history. But we have Daniel Bur- Bibbins confirming those are his granddaughters. So we have a Facebook mm-hmm. post that does that. Like I said, but we're not going to show, but I have it here right in front of me. And uh, that's significant. So we have confirmed this through multiple means is my point. Mm-hmm. Well, now, here's something. Like, so there used to be a like a yeshiva, like for children that you could send children to in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I'm from the Lower East Side. That's a yeshiva, uh, could you, would you say is simply a Jewish day school? Yeah, essentially. Yeah, basically a Jewish, almost like a seminary, a Jewish school is a yeshiva. Yeshiva means school, you know. And uh, generally, we think of yeshivas as like, you know, teaching adults and stuff like that. But there there have been yeshivas that you could send children to. Uh, and there was one called the uh, Yeshiva uh, Zichron Moshe, right? Uh, Jacob Fried wrote about this way back in the 60s. Uh, Bibbins, uh, you know, uh, Edward Meredith Bibbins, the man whom one Westerners call Abba Bibbins, his son Chaim and his daughter-in-law, the wife of Chaim, Esther Bibbins, they were sending their kids to one of these rabbinic uh, yeshivas in the Lower East Side, Yeshiva Zichron Moshe, you know, and uh, Daniel Bibbins, if I'm not mistaken, is a product of that, if not, but uh, certainly it's interesting that Bibbins' grandkids, you know, while Bibbins was still alive, his grandkids were attending a rabbinic yeshiva. And in fact, uh, uh, you can even find, well, not anymore, but at one time you could find uh, them doing a rendition of the Kad Gadya, how do you say? Yeah, you got it. Chad Gadya. Yeah, Chad Gadya is a, it's an Aramaic song. It's popular amongst children. It means literally one goat, you know? So here, I'm going to play some audio from that. No video, yeah, but so I'm just going to play some audio. I have the video here, but you're not going to see it, everyone. But I'm going to play so some audio. So this is just to set it up. It's, it's Bibbins' great-great-grandchildren in the state of Israel singing in Aramaic. Bibbins' great-great-grandchildren in the state of Israel singing, singing in Aramaic. Let that sink in. Absolutely. And 
and it goes on like that for three more minutes. So I don't know if there's any significant. No, there's no need to go on. Yeah, play. but yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, and in like you said, in the state of Israel, in the you know living fully rabbinic lives, fully mainstream Jewish lives. And so yeah. this is part of a uh, one West history in a way. It also shows that you know you never know who you'd be condemning based upon their morphology, because mm. you know they may be condemning you know, Pibbin's own offspring. And and also shows, as aforementioned, the common move from one Westism or something like it into more traditional forms of Judaism. This does happen. In fact, Andre Key, a well-known scholar of Israelism, was once in the old UPK, and he wrote his doctoral thesis on it. It was one of the first doctoral theses I discovered when I was uh poking around for doctoral dissertations that related to one Westism. Do you remember when I first sent you that? And there was a whole chapter yeah. when he was at the HBCU and he talked about being in, in UPK. Now I know some of the language people aren't going to understand what I'm saying here, but do you remember that? Yeah, yeah no, definitely. I definitely remember you sending it to me. I probably still have it somewhere. Yeah. So, and uh, you were about to say that this gentleman, uh, Mr. Key or Dr. Key, he himself, did he himself embrace Judaism? I don't know. At one point, I don't know where he is now in his journey. Clearly, he did at one point. He may have moved into a, a, a more leftward direction. It's unclear because he he. But it seems like at one point along the journey, and I'm not sure where he is now currently. Embrace a more traditional form of Judaism as as well. Um, so this is this is fascinating. So guys, we specialize, and this is what we're talking about. Uh, we're bringing it out. Um, we have some other confirmatory things. For example, this other audio. Do you want to explain the source of that other audio, Abu? No, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't think – is there any other audio? There's no other audio that needs to be played. Oh, the, I think the, the other the, video the I sent was just for you to see. It wasn't – Oh, okay. No, you don't need to play that, no. And I think okay. it's just music anyway. Okay. One okay. thing I'll say is that interestingly – I think I alluded to this earlier. Uh, Daniel Bivens – yeah, he has a film called Pintale Yid. It's actually – that's another thing that's interesting. The, the film that, that Daniel Bivens made has a Yiddish title. Pintale Yid is actually uh, – it means like sort of – literally means like the little point of a Jew. But I, I think uh, Pintale is supposed to allude to like the spark, the divine spark. But it, even that's interesting that the, this film, which Bivens' grandson made about Bivens' son and his you know uh, visiting Israel uh, – it has a Yiddish title, Pintele Yid. I'd, I'd love to see it. Uh, I know Sam Kessenbaum has tried to uh, uh, ask around. Uh, hopefully, maybe this young man who's now studying in Manhattan, maybe he can help with that. I would. I would lo- that's a film that I think a lot of people would like to see. You know, it's it's interesting. Yeah, no doubt. There's, so there's literally a film about Ab- about Edward Meredith Bibbins' son, the man called Abba Bibbins, about his son going to the state of Israel to meet his family that's there because he stayed back in the United States apparently. Now, I'm going to go to um, Andrew Essenston's Twitter, and mm-hmm. I told him about this as soon as I found out about it earlier today. Shout out again to Mr. Colazzo, uh, the homie. And Andrew tweeted about it about four hours ago. So I briefly want to show everyone that and look at a little bit of that thread here. Oops, wrong. Let's see. Wrong button. Okay. You guys can see that. Um, so Andrew has written some articles I've, uh, been involved with and, and whatnot. And I want to show you, uh, this right here. And it's interesting. It appears that the great grandson of Abba Bibbins, sometimes spelled Bibbins, the founder of the Israeli Tanakh school, AKA one West is a student at Yeshiva university in NYC. And I do appreciate that he gave me credit, which journalists don't always do but he he did mm-hmm. right there which i appreciate parsha spo cleveland in the house Ozzie Bibbins for the win jewish cleveland parsha jew talk thank you hashem any comment before i click on that uh real quick can you uh break down what a lot of people may not know the fact that the old one west school was called israeli tanakh school we've talked about it before but if you could just Again. Yes. So, well, like you said, that that's what One West was uh, originally called. It was called the, the Israeli Tanakh School. What's interesting is that now the ISUPK and some other One Westers have this legend where they claim that th- because the ICUPK was known as the Israeli, not Israelite, Israeli Church of, of UPK, of Universal Practical Knowledge. And now the offshoot, the descendant of it, the ISUPK, they call themselves the Israelite School. 
and they claim that it was originally Israelite school, but there's no evidence of that. Mm-hmm. It was the Israeli school, not the mm-hmm. Israelite school. And before it was the, the, the school of UPK, it was the school of Tanakh, you know, but Israeli. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they get into this this very English language thing where yeah. they, they, they have a problem with the word Israeli, but it's a biblical Hebrew term, while the term Israelite is using a uh, – a, a Greco-Roman suffix, then you know the people then, who have these objections. I'm Israelite, not Israeli. They don't understand that Israeli actually uses a, a, a Semitic uh, suffix. But and, that's a story from another day. And then Andrew uh, tweeted in the thread Sam Ketzenbaum's fantastic article uh, that related to the uh, standoff back there, in 2019, and uh, some stuff from JTA uh, that he wrote himself, and I was briefly interviewed for, and. Uh, and then look a lot of interesting cats in that thread, huh? In a brief interview, yeah, I'll point out some of the weirdos in there. In a brief interview in that um, <clears throat> TYH Nation video, as he says, his grandfather broke from the Israelite community and formally converted to Judaism. His father also converted, so yeah, he's Jewish. And mm-hmm. I and then I said thank you for the res- for the credit respect. And then some weirdo Abu Kamer. Technical note, <laughs> Bibbins is the correct spelling. So Yeah, you know, because I think you said Bibbins also known as Bibbins, and I was like, well, you know, Bibbins was his actual – Well, but he is Austin, correct. But, yeah. Most one Westers refer to him as Abba Bibbins. That's what we first yes. heard. And mm-hmm. it made searching for him a little harder, but eventually we discovered. Now, mm-hmm. with that, do you want to switch over to the book element of this, Abu? We sure, had some, sure. I mean, it, some yeah, there's, books. there's small tastes of it. Yeah, there's not a lot of information. I think – uh, we didn't prepare it beforehand, but if you go on Google Books, Jacob Fried has a book from the 60s called Judaism and the Community. Uh, and on in there, there's a – well, I guess I could send you a screenshot and show you that because apparently Google Books only has a, a small snippet. But it talks about uh, Chaim Bibbins and Esther Bibbins sending their kids to uh, to this yeshiva on the Lower East Side, Yeshiva Zichron Moshe. You know, I don't know if you want to show that, but of course we could go to uh, the the book that you have on Hat, on Hatsad Harishon, or the or even that book. Uh... Stepping into Zion, we'll do that one first. Yes. Um, okay, so you ready to read some pages from this? And can you again explain the context here before I dive into okay. this? Okay, page ninety seven. This is yes. Let me say this about Hatsad Harishon. Hatsad Harishon was an organization that was uh, a mix of uh, let's say European Jews or Ashkenazi Jews and uh, Jews who were African American, and they were reaching out to a num. They had a directory of Israelite groups that existed in the late '60s and early '70s, and they were reaching out to different Israelite groups to dialogue with them. We even have a brief correspondence between the man known as Abba Bivens and Hatzad Harishon. You've shown it before on your channel, and that's fascinating. And Hatzad Harishon, their goal was to to attempt through dialogue to bring Israelite groups more fully into the Jewish fold, and the few people that know about it today within the Israelite spectrum treat them like they were a joke or a failure, but it's significant. Like we said, they even grabbed some of the descendants of uh, one yeah. of the sons of, of Bivens. And Bivens. the name, uh, the name doesn't mean first steps. Precisely. Yeah. Hatzad yeah. Hadishon means the first step and hence, That's, you know, stepping uh, into Zion is yeah. a play on that. And in that letter, you know, we have Bivens gave a response. And so we see the name of the school and we also see him threatening to sue them. Yeah. <laughs> so the, all the way back to their founders, these guys have wanted to sue people. Okay, I think I said 97. I meant page 96. Identification's breaking point, Ray and the limits of Jewish reconstitution. Cons- consubstantiality is established by common involvement in a killing. Kenneth Burke, Rhetoric of Motives. Now here's – that's a quote to begin this section. Not long after Sybil spoke highly of her expectations for the youth group's development, she resigned from her position. After her four years of service as the youth activities chairman on the executive board of Hatsad Harishon and as the youth leader advisor of the youth slash young adult group, on February 12th, 1969, she resigned via phone to Mrs. Esther Bibbins. Stipulating mm. that it should become effective immediately at that time. Kaufman resignation letter one. So can you point out the significance of that? Well, Esther Bibbins was the chairperson of Hatsad Harishon. And like we said, that was the daughter-in-law of uh, of the man known as Abba Bibbins. It was the, the wife of one of his sons. And to this, she's currently, her, her the resting place of her remains is right next to the resting uh, place of 
of Bibbins, of the man known as Abba Bibbins. In know? Jersey? Yes. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, now see. Seen, unfortunately, he doesn't have a stone. She does, but he doesn't have a headstone, unfortunately. Now, you wouldn't hire Esther in a group like this unless she represented what you wanted to accomplish and also probably, you know, had had the prerequis- prerequisite for the skills. But I'm saying she represented, uh, I think, what this group wanted to see happen. Would you? Yes, does that make indeed, sense? Indeed. Yeah, so, no, definitely. So she's not going to be employed there. You know, unless 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 she's doing something significant there. Okay, now I'm flipping over to the next section in the same book here. This is in page, I think it's 113. Okay, yeah, here we go. I'm going to read down here. These internal conflicts and external events negatively influence both the adult and youth group's ability to enact successful programming. Internal documents demonstrate that participation was dwindling in both its youth and adult divisions. In the youth newsletters of October and November 1969, interesting, right? The year, that's the year that One West is reported to have started everyone. Black Jewish youth leader Panina Terry urged members to be more active. In the December 1969 adult newsletter, Black Jewish adult leader Esther Bibbins. So that is, uh, I guess, consider her official role, capacity there in the organization, Black Jewish adult leader, or I mean, uh, that's sort of chairperson, president, she, something like that. She had a very, she was very high ranking within the organization. I know that. Made a similar plea to Hatzad's adult members. In the summer of 1970, Yaakov Gladstone, the group's white Jewish founder and executive director, resigned and explained that he could no longer ignore the issue of conversion. In his resignation letter, he urged Hatzad's black members to convert to uphold Kalal is Yisrael. It was amid this inner turmoil that James Benjamin assumed the role of executive director in October 1970. So this is essentially, you know, history of the organization. But in that, because of her involvement, Esther Bibbins appears a number of times. And again, Abu, who is Esther Bibbins? Daughter-in-law of the founder of One West. And lastly, the last entry I think that we have that is relevant is uh, it's a note from chapter five on page one sixty-seven of this book, and but it's it's note six. There are four different explanations of Yaakov Gladstone's resignation in the Hatzad Harishon files. The first comes in an unmailed May 11, 1970 letter addressed to Mrs. Esther Bibbins, Hatzad's then president. There you go. Yeah, president of Hatzad Harishon. So at that time, yep. she was the president of Abu. Yep. Do, will people ever understand? <laughs> I don't know if the... In this version, Gladstone states that he is willing to resign, that the organization will have a new black director without bloodshed starting in September. The next one is addressed to Naomi Franklin. Da, 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 da. Okay, I think that's all. There was one other section in the bibliography, but I didn't think it was relevant. But no, yeah. you're seeing something important there relating to the family. And then, you know, I think Esther Bibbins, as far as academic published works, name has been mentioned probably more than Abba Bibbins has. Her, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I, I can't stress this enough. You know, people think that Hatzada, for the few people who are aware of Hatzada Arishon that within the Israelite spectrum, they seem to think it was a flop. But I, I think it's, it's significant that, you know, some of Bibbins' own family were, you know, some of the family of the founder of One West were, were in, within this organization. Now and, and on, impacted by it, you know. In African Zion Studies in Black Judaism by Bruder and Parfit, I only have one entry unless there's another one I'm not aware of. No, just know. page two forty three. I think it's the yeah. only time she's mentioned. Hey, uh, do you think if you ever convert to one Westism we can call you Abu Bibbins? <laughs> Perhaps, but they they'd probably tell me there's no you in any Semitic language. So. Oh yeah, they probably would, yeah. That's not Yiddish. Okay, here we go, page 243. In the case of Gladstone, so this is uh, leading through listening racial tensions in 1968 New York. That's the chapter, page 243. In the case of Gladstone and Matthew, the divisive topic was the content of the minutes, the intention behind them, 
and the racist assumptions expressed within them. Since Gladstone begins his second apology by asserting his position and refuting claims, it is not surprising that relations between Hatzat Harishon and Rabbi Matthew's congregation chilled considerably as a consequence. Now, before I go any further, you got to drop some knowledge on Rabbi Matthew and how this relates to what we're going to talk about. Oh, yes. Super significant. Uh, Matthews was the founder of the Commandment Keepers, where uh, the founder of One West was before he founded One West. He mm-hmm. was a student of, in Matthew's school. And this is going to be significant because now he's going. To, the book is going to mention the uh, the wife of one of Bibbin's sons. There we go. The distance between them persisted, even though Matthew played an instrumental role in training several prominent black Jewish members of Hatzad Hadishon. Rabbi Matthew had taught Hebrew to Esther Bibbins, the first right. president of Hatzad Hadishon, a black Jewish woman who had converted to Orthodox Jew- Judaism, and he had also trained another prominent black Jewish rabbi, Moshe Halu Paris. Mm-hmm. Who, by the way, is also buried basically like a, a just a, a few feet from both Esther Bibbins and uh, Edward Meredith Bibbins, known as, as Abba Bibbins. Uh, they're, they're all buried in the same graveyard, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure I saw Hailu Paris's uh, grave as well. But yeah, it, it's it's significant because so Esther Bibbins was apparently a member of the Commandment Keepers. She was apparently, I'm guessing she was there at the same time that, that Bibbins and his son, whom she married, were there, you know, and she wound up converting to Orthodox Judaism. You know, there's it's it's a, it's it's a really underlooked subject. It's a subject that's not discussed enough. The the phenomenon of Israelites converting to Judaism. You know, and um, isn't it the uh, isn't it the case that we have examples of rolls or records from the commandment keepers in which we see Bibbin's name and I believe some of his yep. family as well and his son. Yep. Yeah. Which yeah, son is it? Do you remember? Uh, I think it's Edward. It, 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 the, I think the name is Edward Jr. I don't know if that's Chaim or if it's the other son, because he had a son named William and a son named Edward Jr. I think, and one of them became Chaim. But I'm sorry, I'm not sure who, which one is which. And isn't it the case that um, um, that one of them helped Bibbins write his first book? That was speculative. That was a speculation that I had offered. That that the um. That because the the way the the name was written on the cover of that book, it was sort of you know the the E and the W and all that. That was a speculation that I had offered because mm. uh, you know it, it's it's written and if I recall correctly, it's been been a while since I thought about this, but uh, there's like sort of first person plural references and stuff like that, and I think Bibbins even like alludes to a partner who might have helped him in that, and you know. And the way the W was capitalized and enlarged, you know, the whole thing sort of. It was, so I offered the speculation that maybe it was one of his sons. Someone should drop that uh, link if they can in the uh, in the live chat. Shout out to the live chat, by the way. Do you have any questions for us? We wanted to break this down and explain this for memory purposes. I think it was important mm-hmm. for people to see. Shout out to Mr. Phil Fox, a great mod. Radar Apologetics in the house. A number of other brothers and sisters. Some great folks. Some channel members in here. <laughs> Say what? A uh, gentleman who, who uh, Berean calls a Dunamis. I think I think his name is pronounced Dunami. Oh, shout uh, out Dunamis. Yeah, I met him last year. He's yeah. a great brother. Yep. He's a good guy. He's there also we go. And a shout out to Alejandro. Okay, so I'm going to play the initial clip that got this all started one more time. But can mm-hmm. you explain, kind of rewind, summarize, explain why this is significant for historical apologetic purposes, why we wanted to do this tonight? And uh, and talk about well, I, it briefly. I, what's funny about this, I, I would say that this show is sort of a, a preliminary look. We're going to continue to attempt to, to follow this trail. Uh, but for anyone interested in the history of One West, whether apologetically or not, uh, anyone interested in the history of One West, this is an interesting field that the, the, the founder of One West is, is this, uh, some of his son, is, uh, may, perhaps both his sons, but some of his descendants, you know, uh, became part of the mainstream Jewish world and there's, we recently came across a video of his, I believe, great grandson, uh, who's now studying at Yeshiva University in Manhattan. And you know, so this is just a, one more uh, thread to follow in the attempts to, you know, piece together the interesting story of One West history and the, the history of the of the Bibbins 
family, you know, and in, 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 a, in a sense, I would say this show is like a, a first step of our own. It's our own little hot sauce, you know, <laughs> cornball. Now, don't you think some one Westers are going to be very upset to hear about Bibbins offspring converting into more traditional Judaism? Perhaps some might, uh, some might accept it. I know there was, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Arya's, uh, was he a nephew? Like a nephew? Yeah, who was a yeah. Nawabian. So, I mean, it's yeah. it's understood that, that the leadership rarely do their kids stay in it, you know? So it's sort of understood that the family members of a lot of the, the names, a lot of the leadership names, the family more often than not is uh, not part of the, the, the spectrum. So let's play the video one more time that got this all started here. And then we'll wind down one more time. Yep. Just party. Nah, my grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great grandfather started some sect of black Israelites. That's like pretty known today. We're here with Ozzy Bibbins. Ozzy, where are you from? Cleveland. CLE till I die. Are you in YU? Yeah, I just got here like a week ago. So here's how it works. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions on Parsha's bow. Each question you get two dollars. You get all of them right, you get a hundred bucks. Ready? What was the first plague in this week's Parsha? Parva. That's correct. P Parsha's bow. What's that? That's a, a so a, a, a parsha is a a section of the Torah. The Torah is divided up in such a way that it can be read uh, bit by bit across a year, week by week. Each each week is a different portion. So, like a year and a Bible in a year type of reading plan. Exactly. So it's Torah in a year, and and and, and parshat bo uh, refers to the portion that covers a part of the Exodus story. Yeah, except they they're kind of way. I mean, Christians are out here trying to do Old and New Testament in a year. These guys are just doing Torah in a year, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have as much to cover there. But uh, on the screen, just remind everybody, we are looking at the great-grandson of Bibbins, the founder of One Must Israelism. He is now a student at Yeshiva University. One more – I don't think everyone understands the significance of Yeshiva University. Uh, can you say a little something about that? It's, a, it's an Orthodox Jewish uh, university in Upper Manhattan in Washington Heights, and so uh, yeah, it, if you're studying there, you're <laughs> you're pretty well enmeshed into the the uh, the, the rabbinic Jewish spectrum. And watch by the way, Parshat Bo is uh, I think it's chapters ten, eleven, and twelve and thirteen of uh, of Exodus. Wash Heights used to be uh, heavy Spanish speaking, but it's I think more diverse now. Yeah, it, it uh, yeah, in the '90s, it was a very strongly uh, Dominican uh, community. Uh, perhaps less so now because of gentrification in, in mm -hmm. Manhattan. But yeah. All right, so here we go. How many plagues are in this week's parsha? Three. What are they? There we go. <laughs> what did Hashem tell the Jews to do with the blood of their lambs and why? Smear it on the top of their doorposts. And why? So God knew that they were Jews and He would pass over them during which plague? Makat That's. Uh, for his pronunciation, is you think he's known? Yeah, Shmir. I noticed he said Shmir. Did you yeah, that? isn't that Yiddish? Yeah, I think so. He <laughs> put a little Yiddish on him. I love it. You know where I? You know where I first heard Shmir? You know, uh, was from Jeff Cran. He was like, "Yeah, the Shmir on the bagel." I was like, "What?" Yeah, and exactly. That's the context that's usually used in in, in New York. Yeah, and then I yeah. went to the, a local shop here, Chompy's, which is like a New York bagel spot, and I was like, "Oh, they don't. They call it Shmir there." It's like, oh, yeah. so you know, the Shmir of cream cheese. Yeah, exactly. I mean. I, I don't know. It's kind of humorous for, to me to hear that in a, a Passover context, you know? Mm -hmm. Sh Sh Smear the blood. Yeah, exactly. Smear the blood. And then uh, you got to schlep your stuff out of the out of, out of Egypt. You got to schlep all your, yes. your gear. You got to yeah. schlep all your stuff down the block, you know, looking like a putz. <laughs> I, I don't know as much Yiddish as you, but. I don't know that much either, but yeah. <laughs> oh, don't lie. We know the Jesuits taught you I did you a lot. notice and say Smear. All right, let's Are you Sephardic? Nah. My grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great grandfather started some sect of black Israelites Did that's it? like pretty known today. It's what chilling. And then my grandfather decided he wanted to convert because, like, wanted to be part of the Jewish community. He converted, married a Puerto Rican woman, and then my dad was born. And then they weren't sure if the conversion process for my grandmother was correct. So. Can, can you? That's a big thing. They weren't sure if the conversion process for my grandmother was correct. Speculate, Abu. Well, just that. I mean, I guess the um, when they here's my guess uh, that 
you know, they, they met with some rabbinic authority and they didn't particularly trust the people who conducted her conversion or she didn't have, uh, you know, maybe a, a significant document. That's That would be my guess. But that does happen fairly often within the Jewish spectrum. Someone will convert and, and somebody else won't necessarily recognize. There's so many versions of that. Like if you convert at like a conservative uh, synagogue or something like that, you know, an Orthodox synagogue you might not recognize it or... You know, now there's even different shades of orthodoxy that don't recognize each other. Like uh, I know um, David Berger, who's a professor at Yeshiva University, he talks about how uh, he questions uh, the acceptance of uh, people converted by Chabad because of their messianic belief. Oh, you know? And I don't yeah. mean messianic is in pro Jesus. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, that's interesting. I've heard a lot of people um, actually questioning the conversion credentials of Richard Katz. Because they're concerned that he doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sephardic. I'm speculating he asked him if he's Sephardic because of his phenotype. Yeah, that would be my guess as well. Yes. Like, hey, you might look Sephardic. You know, maybe you came from uh, the Iberian Peninsula, whatever, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, or no, Africa, here's, exactly, my, yeah. here's my actual background. Mm-hmm. And then that's when we hear, this is Bibbins' great-grandson. I mean, now, he doesn't say Bibbins, but we know. That's why I was yeah. saying real quick, filling in the blank. So let's listen to this one more time, and we're going to get out of here. Nah, my grandmother is Puerto Rican. My grandfather is black. Is there a story there? My great-grandfather started to... He's talking about Bibbins, everybody. Sect of black Israelites. He's talking about One West, everybody. That's like pretty known today. It's chilling. And then my grandfather decided he wanted to convert because like once he's part of the Jewish community, he converted. So grandfather, we don't know if this is Kayim or. Yeah, I don't know, unfortunately. Yeah. So we don't know which. If I had to guess. The, I, yeah, I'm uncertain. I really am uncertain. I'm guessing it's Kayim, but I don't know. I don't know. We don't know which son this would be, but which will be his grandfather. Married a Puerto Rican woman, and then my dad was born, and then they weren't sure if the conversion process for my grandmother was correct, so my dad had to get also converted when he was, like, a little bit older. That so because they weren't sure about the grandmothers, then his dad had to do his own conversion because they weren't sure if the lineage was proper pedigree? Exactly, yeah. Okay. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying yeah. to... They weren't sure if he was halakhically Jewish, so... Or they questioned that there was a doubt... I, know, I Garfield could... just interviewed. Um, it, funny enough, since we mentioned the Ashkenazi Sephardic uh, divide, uh, Garfield just interviewed uh, Rabbi Eliezer Tamota, and he talked about how within the Sephardic spectrum, they question your conversion if there's a legitimate reason to do so. Like if someone, if they found uh, you know a doubt, but he says the Ashkenazim they go looking for the doubt. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a little more of a, which you know all that's very interesting because you have these. A lot of people within the spectrum of Judaism, however you find that, have worked hard to try to ensure some level of uh, authentic lineage in various ways. Some of what I said mm -hmm. you can interpret however you want, but it's like you see it and you're like, you know, there's some precision here. This isn't just happy slappy. Now, I could see a lot of One Westers watching this, and if they understood what's being said about it, would be actually highly offended at what he's saying. You see what I'm saying? Because they're like, why mm -hmm. would we need to convert? We are Israelites. Right? Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Wait, wait. I have a lot to say on that. Uh, one thing I'll say right now is imagine the, this is a young man, but as he becomes an adult, I don't think it's absurd to, to think that he's going to marry eventually a woman who's part of the mainstream Jewish community. You know, and so uh, the thing is, uh, you've shown the clip of Haka talking about how maybe there's one or two yeah. members there of the ancient Jewish community who are, uh, who, who are descendants of Jacob. And I take it for granted that they would assume this young man is a descendant of Jacob. And so mm -hmm. I think it shows that, uh, you know, within their paradigm, there's nothing absurd about even. Yeah, modernity. because his known lineage is uh, Judah, according to the 12 tribes chart. Uh, and then not that it's relevant to their understanding, but of course, Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Easy story. The bottom line is Jews come in different flavors. Okay, ready? How many Israeli? How many men left Egypt? Six hundred thousand. That's correct. Final one. What famous Jewish food was invented in this week's parsha? Matzah. <laughs> yeah, that is correct. There you go. Hundred bucks, baby. Let's get from one to ten. How good is matzah? Shmura matzah is a solid eleven out of ten. Yehuda matzah with some cream cheese or something else. It's a solid eight. 
prefer Italian food personally, but hey, you know, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Just, there's yeah, probably just... an Italian matzo in, in history. I don't know. <laughs> you think so? Oh, maybe. Well, I mean, Are... there's Sephardi matzo. Why, there, so there could be some sort of, you know, there's Italian Jewish communities. Maybe they, they had their, they might have had their own matzo. All right. Well. I think that this has been helpful. Let me answer yeah, that question. Yeah, it's a good start. It's a good start, and we'll, we'll return to the subject in the future, God willing. John Lee says, uh, Joaquin uh Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We got a question, uh, Joaquin Blaze. Is this movement growing or has it reached somewhat of a plateau? Not even close to reaching a plateau yet. The movement is definitely growing, and that's why... And evolving. It, yes, growing and evolving. And that's why now you have some mainstream folks actually finally paying attention to it. And it's actually come up in the news just recently because Kyrie Irving got traded to the Dallas Mavericks. And when he got traded, he deleted his apology tweet about the Hebrews to Negroes documentary. He deleted mm. that tweet when he got traded. And it's interesting, interesting because you know the owner of the Mavericks is not Cuban, despite the fact that his name is Mark Cuban. He's Russian Jewish in his lineage. Before, the owner of Brooklyn's team is not. Uh, I believe he's Asian. So it's interesting what's happening here. It'd be interesting <laughs> to see. What, what, what? I might want to do No, I'm wondering, show. was the, was the non-Jewish owner uh, uh, offended on behalf of his Jewish friends while the Jewish owner isn't as offended? I read some quotes about what Cuban said in relationship to Kyrie. And he basically said, I think his heart's in the right place, but maybe there's some education that needs to happen. You know, he tried to have a very well, I charitable. I certainly think his heart is in the right place. I don't think he's a malicious person. I really don't. Yeah, yeah. And he had, a, you know, he had a very charitable reading of everything. And uh, the second I went on Twitter guess or Instagram, guess what I saw on Ron Dalton's page? Kyrie deletes the apology, and I've never apologized. Now I'm going to tell my story in a brand new video. <laughs> Man, Ron, the perpetual self-promotion machine that is Ron Dalton. <laughs> Although mean- perhaps it's worth noting that both Ron Dalton and Kyrie Irving are outside of the One West Spectrum. And in this video, we've been focusing on the founder of the One West yes, Spectrum. Yes, they are. In fact, I think um, the documentary that uh, Dalton produced is called – it's rated NC, non-camp. No but you know what's funny about it? I'm not it joking, not by the does, way, everyone. That's what the, it really yeah, says. Yeah, it really does that. say that. Yeah. But then what, one of the great ironies of that is that then it, it proceeds to argue that not only the African diaspora in the Americas are Israelites, but so too Native Americans. So it's sort of – without endorsing the tribe's chart, it sort of gives most of the tribe chart some support. The Hebraic Indian theory. That's called yeah. – scholars sometimes call that the Hebraic Indian theory. There's other names for it, but the Hebraic Indian theory is, is one because it has ex- existed a long time ago. And later on, Joseph Smith picked it up. It's a whole thing there as well. Mr. Phil Fox and I still need to do some shows on that. Shout out to mm. BK Apologists as well. So, yeah, they're still growing. They have not plateaued. My little prediction is that Israelism has maybe about 40 to 20 years. And I'm going to say somewhere between there. So let's go with 30 years of growth. And I'm me for me. I'm not only doing this, but I'm just telling you my little prediction here. OK, I um tie part of it in relationship to Generation X and older millennials because I'm viewing a cutoff line there where the general respect for the Bible is going to be the same within the communities that they're targeting, and there's going to be a direct fall off to the decrease of the influence of the Christian church to the shrinkage of Israelism in the future as things Great secularize. Point. Huh? Because it's parasitic on the Christian church. Yeah. Because it's parasitic on the Christian church. That That's, that's my actual yeah. prediction is I tie it in with numbers. Yeah. So when the sort of as gen- the host shrinks, so to the parasite. Yes. Now, within the communities they target, change is slower. The secularization process is not as speedy as it is within other types. Kind of like the way America is generally behind Europe and Canada in its progressivism. Uh, but nonetheless, mm-hmm. you're going to see it go. You know, California's first, and the rest of the country. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. It's a little stream of consciousness. I know what I'm saying, but uh, I think that's what you're going to see there. Uh, this is not a prophecy. I'm not pulling. Okay, this is not a prophecy. This is speculation, like the way that uh, people at the beginning of the NBA se- season say Suns are going to finish se- second in the Western Conference or something like that. Okay, that's that's that kind of thing. Okay, I'm not doing an, <laughs> an Aria false prophecy, 1999, 2000 here. Okay. Okay, so I'll let everyone know that. Okay, anything – because someone in the live chat is actually saying I'm a false prophet because of that. But that's <laughs> that's probably because he's an optimist because he thinks he's lit part of some religious revival. 
and he's wrong. You know, he he's 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 all jumped up on one West juice, kind of like the Nation of Islam used to think they were about to do something, you know, take part of the southern United States. And they were wrong, you know, and when Farrakhan dies, it's going to be in war, even worse for their movement, you know. OK, final words, Abu, what do you got coming up? People should follow you on Twitter and subscribe to your YouTube channel. What else you want to say, bro? Well, I think, you know, I, I have a playlist on One West History. Uh, I think I'll probably add this show to it. And I think this is a step towards more information on this fascinating subject. That's all That's all the real intention of the show was. Yeah. Just a first glimpse at an interesting uh, uh, trail of, uh, of information. No doubt. With that, I appreciate y'all. Uh, be sure to subscribe, like that video, all that type of stuff. And uh, send some super chats and jump on Patreon so we can make it to 100, blah, 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 blah. Peace out, y'all. God bless.